Today on Visual Politic, we are going to present the most 2021 story of the year 2021. It goes like this. Thousands of Iraqi asylum seekers on the border shared by Poland and Belarus. And what's so special about that? Take a look at this map. Iraq is here, Belarus is here, and Poland is here. You're thinking what I'm thinking, aren't you? What are Iraqis doing crossing the border between Belarus and Poland? Well, that's what we're going to tell you in this video. What we have is this. On the Belarusian side, up to 7,000 Iraqis, but also Syrians, Iranians, Afghans, and Lebanese. They're on the border, and what they want is to enter the European Union. Which way? Through the three EU countries that have the immense good fortune of being Belarus's neighbors. We are talking about Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia. As you can imagine, none of them are happy to suddenly see all of these people on their border. And to top it all off, it's not like anyone's being welcomed with open arms. Check this out. Violence erupts on Poland-Belarus border as Polish guards fire water cannon on migrants throwing rocks. Exactly. There's a hail of stones on one side, water cannons and tear gas on the other. Migrants trying to break down border posts, Poland reinforcing the border, Lithuania starting to build a wall, NATO considering intervening, and all of this happened in less than a month. The almost 7,500 miles or 1,200 kilometers of border between Belarus and the European Union have seen so much action that even the latest James Bond film would pale in comparison. And you'll probably say, let's see Grant, you're painting it as a gargantuan crisis. But 7,000 people between three countries, it's not that big a deal, is it? After all, in 2015, the EU received more than a million asylum seekers and continues to do so. Well, tell that to the Prime Minister of Poland. Ladies and gentlemen, I turn to you because Europe our common home is threatened. As you can see, for Poland, what is happening on its border is a full-blown declaration of war. And if Mr. Morawiecki was saying two months ago that the EU is blackmailing him, there he is appealing to Brussels and to common values. <laughs> now, in any case, Poland would not be the only victim in this story because at the time of making this video, at least 13 migrants have lost their lives. Remember that we are also talking about families. We're talking about children, even newborns. Above all, we're talking about winter. Boy, 14, dies from cold on Belarus border as migrants weaponized an escalating crisis. And the questions you might be pondering are one, used as weapons by whom? Who is the bad guy in the story? The evil mastermind behind it all? Two, what on earth are the Iraqis doing crossing the border between Poland and Belarus? Three, and where are they now? What was the outcome of all this? Was it one of those stories we won't even remember tomorrow? Or should we really be worried? Today, we're gonna answer all of these questions. But first, let's take a little trip down history road. The man who wanted to be a supervillain. I know, I know what some of you are thinking. Surely Russia must be involved here because of course we are talking about Belarus. Russia, a country that doesn't typically pull the strings of international politics on its own. And indeed, there are people who say that everything that's happening now on the Belarusian border is part of Putin's grand plan to destabilize Europe in order to make Russia great again and dominate the world. But the truth is that, at least technically, it doesn't make much sense that this Belarusian crisis is being orchestrated from Moscow. What's more, it wouldn't be the first time that Belarus has imposed itself on the interests of its Russian big brother. In this story, it looks like Mr. Lukashenko is the sole author. And who is Lukashenko? For those of you who are new to visual politic, welcome, and haven't yet seen all the videos we've made about Belarus, I'm going to give you a slight spoiler. Belarus is a dictatorship. What's more, it is the last great dictatorship in Europe. And on top of that, it doesn't try to disguise it at all. In fact, it pretty much does the opposite. If a dictator pride day is ever invented, Lukashenko would be the queen of the parade. Check this nonsense out. It's better to be a dictator than gay, declares Belarus president. Yes, that's right, Mr. Alexander Lukashenko. Some kids want to be astronauts or YouTubers. He wanted to be a dictator. You heard about it. Let me make even clearer. Alexander Lukashenko is a man who wanted to be a supervillain. And as far as that plan goes, he hasn't done too badly. He has become the dictator of a country of 9 million inhabitants. 
He came to power 27 years ago and he's enjoyed it so much that he's decided to stay, if possible, forever. And of course, as there is a growing part of the population that is not happy to live under a dictatorship, the Belarusian regime has been gradually tightening its fist in recent years. Firstly, by banning protests with fines, arrests, police charges and various repressions. Secondly, by restricting freedom of the press. As of today, there are several media outlets that have either had to be shut down or are inaccessible from Belarus. We are talking about a full-blown offensive. Belarus journalists jailed for two years for live-streaming protest. Tut.by, a news site read by more than 40% of Belarusian internet users, has been blocked and its editors questioned after their offices and houses were raided by authorities. Given all this, it should come as no surprise that Belarus is the country with the least press freedom in all of Europe. Yes, it's even worse than Turkey. And you can probably imagine how politics works in this country. The last presidential elections were held in August last year. At first, things looked surprisingly good. Lukashenko was obviously the main candidate, but there was also several opposition names on the provisional ballot that had popular support. And there were even analysts who said, look, maybe it's time for a transition, a new president, and maybe, just maybe, even a little bit of democracy. If you've been following visual politics for a while, you already know what happened because we dedicated an entire video to it at the time. By the way, this is a great moment where we should remind you to subscribe to this channel and take a look at our Patreon page. But that's enough of that. Let's Let's get back to today's story. In case you don't remember what happened in the latest Belarusian elections, here's a summary in three news items. Belarus bans two opposition candidates from running in elections. Belarus opposition figures detained before presidential vote. Belarus election. Opposition leader Tikhanovskaya left for sake of her children. As you can imagine, when election day came, neither protests nor international pressure were enough to guarantee even a minimum level of transparency. And with that, Lukashenko began his sixth term in office more dictatorial than ever. To make it clear, there are up to 800 political prisoners in Belarusian jails today. And no one is safe because Lukashenko's regime has very long arms. Just check out one of the most surreal news stories of this year. Ryanair flight carrying an opposition journalist is forced to land in Belarus. That's right. Under the guise of a fake bomb threat, Belarus hijacked a Ryanair plane that was flying from Greece to Lithuania, all to bring down an opposition journalist and take him to prison. That's right, we're all thinking the same thing, a Ryanair plane. So you know, next time you fly on a low cost airline, maybe don't complain if your seat isn't comfortable or if they don't let you take your suitcase on board. Just be thankful that Belarus hasn't hijacked your entire flight. Come on, if Lukashenko doesn't deserve a supervillain of the year award for that, alone, I don't know what else to tell you guys. Or, hang on, yes, what about this ultimate evil plan? The strategy nominated for 2021 Dictatorial Screwballs Awards. We're gonna look at that now. More Maxwell smart than smart. Before I talk about this idea of the century, I have to tell you one thing. Obviously, Lukashenko's trickery does not only have an impact on Belarus. Remember that Ryanair flight? Until May of this year, no one thought that a country, however dictatorial, could hijack a commercial airliner flying over its airspace in this way. Of course, the European Union and others haven't stood idly by. What they are doing is imposing sanctions and other such measures. We are talking, for example, about an embargo on arms and other goods that could be used for repression. But above all, we are talking about sanctions with a name and a surname against 100 166 representatives of the regime. Their assets are frozen and they cannot travel to or through the EU. Obviously, Alexander Lukashenko himself is one of those sanctioned and the EU does not recognize his government. Well, I think you can imagine what the dynamic is. Belarus takes one more step towards a perfect dictatorship. The EU responds with a sanctions package. Belarus represses journalists. Another sanctions package. Falsify elections. Another. Hijack a plane. More sanctions. And here we have Mr. Lukashenko doing whatever he wants for decades, even if his people have to suffer the consequences. If you think being a dictator is easy, you are wrong. But then again, maybe if the EU is your neighbor, you're not. <laughs> On the one hand, he wants to have the last word because he needs to project a strong image, both to the population that still supports him and to the outside world. But on the other hand, tell me, what can Belarus do to fight against the EU? And that's when this man, in his eagerness to be an evil genius, said, OK, how can I attack the EU and get some revenge for these trade sanctions and, if possible, force them to sit down at the table with me and recognise me as president? Can I attack them with my army? No. Can I wage a trade war like Putin once did with natural gas? Yet. Can I send terrorists there? 
No. Well, we're getting close to the climax of this thought process. I don't know whether Lukashenko has seen the Queen's Gambit and thinks he's a strategist, or whether he just dreamed it all up. But what you're about to see has happened in real life. Check this out. Belarus dictator threatens to flood EU with drugs and migrants. Come on, doesn't that sound like a supervillain movie idea? Besides, it may seem surprising, but when Lukashenko wants something, nothing is impossible. Let's recap the moves. Step one, organize a migration crisis. The first thing you need are migrants themselves, right? And if you don't have them at hand, you have to bring them to you. How? By organizing whole publicity campaign in countries where people have many reasons to want to leave. Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Afghanistan, and other hotspots around the world. To convince them, promises like this should probably do it. Common misinformation spread in the past included every refugee receives a welcome payment of 2,000 euros. A welcome payment in Germany, a guaranteed job in the EU. These are just some of the promises behind this migration crisis. So now we're on step two. Let's get down to the logistics. How do we bring all these people to the EU's doorstep? Very easily, by issuing Belarusian tourist visas like there's no tomorrow. Once we have them, we put these tourists on Irish planes operated by Belarusian airline. When they arrive in Belarus, we bring them to the border and tell them where they need to go to cross the border into Poland and then to get to Germany. And voila, the magic trick of pulling a migration crisis out of the bag is done. And now you're gonna ask me, do we have any certainty that Belarus is helping the migrants get to the border? Well, let's see. Now помогают им перебраться на польскую территорию, да? Слушайте, вполне возможно. Вот я вполне это допускаю. Well, come on, repeat what Mr. Lukashenko said. To dissemble is for the weak. Now that you know what the master plan consists of, tell me what could go wrong. Well, we're gonna look at that now. The new hybrid war. Sure, maybe Lukashenko was convinced that Brussels would insist on accepting and distributing migrants and asylum seekers. Poland was opposed it, as it did in 2016, and that, with this, the EU's eastern and western blocs would enter into a civil war to the death. But the truth is that the EU has shown itself to be rather more cohesive than Lukashenko expected, possibly for the first time ever. The European Commission has earmarked $792,000 for the humanitarian aid, and the Red Cross is operating in the area. Poland and Lithuania are reinforcing their borders. There is a lot of room for improvement, but, at least for the moment, the situation is de-escalating. And this is because the first thing the EU did was to turn off the migration tap. Firstly, they talked to the countries of origin and transit, pressuring them, for example, with the possibility of taking away development aid. Secondly, they also put pressure on airlines by threatening them with sanctions. As a result, transit countries such as Uzbekistan, Turkey or the United Arab Emirates began to restrict flights to Belarus. In addition, the Iraqi government has allocated planes to start bringing its own people back. Hundreds of migrants arrive back in Iraq on flight from Belarus. And you might say, so that's it, isn't it? This is a very specific story that happened in Belarus, and it has no repercussions for the rest of the world. Well, surprising as it may seem, this is not the first time that migrants and asylum seekers have been used as a political weapon. We saw this with Turkey in 2015, and more recently with Morocco. Turkey was in the path of one of the main migration routes after the Syrian war, and that is precisely why it was able to impose its conditions on the 2016 migration agreement. Basically, Ankara received European funds in exchange for controlling the access of migrants and asylum seekers to the EU. To date, the country remains a key gatekeeper, so whether it likes it or not, Brussels has to rely on Erdogan. And this year, in Spain, we saw a migration crisis organized by Morocco, another country that acts as a migration filter for Europe. After a Swahari leader was hospitalized in the northern Spanish city of Logroño, what a coincidence, by the way, thousands of migrants suddenly started arriving in Ceuta. As you can see, migrants and asylum seekers are indeed used to lobby in international politics. And okay, Belarus is also a country that borders the EU, but unlike Turkey and Morocco, Belarus is not in the middle of a migration flow. If there is one thing the Polish Prime Minister and Ursula von der Leyen agree on, it is that Lukashenko is trying to orchestrate a hybrid war with completely artificial migration crises. So the question is, was it worth it? Well, no. Okay, Lukashenko has managed to get everyone's attention. He's even spoken twice with Angela Merkel, but that's where his advantages end. Besides, let's see what he does when the migrants who don't make it to Poland, but don't return to Iraq either. If they stay in Minsk, Lukashenko will most likely flood himself with all those asylum seekers. Now, of course, this is not a bad thing for Belarus, but it could lead to political problems. 
Remember that, unlike Europe, Belarus does not have sufficient resources to integrate all those migrants, nor does it have a labor market that can absorb them. We'll be keeping an eye on how events unfold in the coming months, but everything indicates that Lukashenko wanted to be a supervillain from a Bond movie, and he's instead become kind of a Dr. Evil. But now, the question is over to you. What do you think of Lukashenko's plan? Do you know of any other cases where migrants are used as weapons? And how would you act in this case if you were in Brussels? You can leave your answers in the comments below. As always, don't forget that here on Visual Politic, we release new videos every week. So subscribe to this channel and hit the little bell down there so you don't miss any of our updates. If you like this video, like it so we can find out and feel all chuffed with ourselves. Take care, and I'll see you next time.